It's the idea that virtually all you know, Western countries subscribe to. And so from a, from a Muslim point of view, what, we, we, you, what should you get from that? I mean, so th th there's this civilization called the West, which was pretty, uh, pretty backward once in a once. Like, ten, like if you go back to a thousand years ago, you would see that the Islamic world was the center of world civilization, and the West was in pretty bad shape. I always say that you know, if you go back to a thousand years ago, Baghdad and Cordoba were the brightest cities on earth, and Paris and London were just you know, mud and full of you know, dirt and so on, not very interesting. But things changed, and the West progressed for, 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 for many reasons, which we can speak about. And then, then these people have this idea of how to run a modern society. And when I say a modern, which means technologically advanced, educated people, uh, for example, we are, mod we are all modern individuals. What it means is that we go to a school, we learn you know, medicine, we learn science, we learn how to make our judgments, we learn foreign languages, which help us to understand the world. We can read a book, we can write a paper, we can think about it, which means that now we can make our own judgments. Th that that's what I mean by a modern individual. But I mean, if we were living 300 years ago, perhaps we would be just feeding some cattle in a village and that would be the only thing we know in life. So we would not be maybe that independently thinking. But now we are independently thinking, which means that we are part of the modern world. But how, what we will get from the modern world is the question. Um, and again, uh, I think here that liberal democracy is basically, yes, from my point of view, a, a political system which is compatible with Islamic values. Uh, at least it's a political system in which you can live Islam, you can practice Islam, and you can articulate you know, your Islamic values and even make them into policy. You can say, well, these are the values I believe in and I support them under a liberal democratic state. And Turkey has come to this point, and let me tell you how it happened in the first place. Well, uh, actually, to understand Turkey, we have to go back to the Ottoman Empire. Uh, of course, the Ottoman Empire was the superpower of the Islamic world from the 15th century on. And uh, much of what we call today the Middle East was actually the Ottoman Empire. All of North Africa, the whole Middle East, you know, Arab states, uh, Balkans, much of the Balkans was the Ottoman Empire. When, when the Ottoman Empire fell, you know, it was destroyed in First World War I, more than 40 states you know, emerged from the Ottoman Empire. And uh, again, like all of North Africa, the Balkans, and uh, even like the, today what you know is Iraq, Syria, these are all remnants of the Ottoman Empire. Uh, and when you actually look at the map of Iraq, you will see that it's a very, there are very clear lines drawn by the British on a table like in 1920s, early 20s, because just, they just created this new artificial state called Iraq or Syria. Uh, even Lebanon. So, I mean, the British and the French redesigned the Middle East according to their own perspective uh, in, the, in the aftermath of World War I, and these states emerged, but that they were all run by the Ottoman Empire. And the Ottoman Empire was, of course, an Islamic state. It was uh, run by a caliph, you know, the, the, the supre supreme authority of Islam, and it had a Sharia rule, and it was Islamic. But one thing which is interesting about Ottoman Empire was the existence of multiple legal systems, which means that Christians were appreciated as Christians and they had their own culture, they had their own religion, they had their own legal system. Jews were tolerated as Jews and they, they again, they, were, they had their synagogues, they could worship. And Muslims were Muslims. Uh, and the ethnic differences between the Muslims were you know, uh, neglected. I mean, whether you're a Kurd or a Turk or an Arab was not that important, you were basically a Muslim. So these, actually the Ottoman Empire called all these different religious groups as nations, millet in Arabic. So the empire had what we call the millet system. Muslims were one group and you, know, you had one nation and Jews and Christians were regarded as different nations. Uh, but something happened, like uh, this, actually this goes back to the earliest days of Islam. You know, I mean, when Prophet Muhammad uh, wasallam, when he did his Medina treaty with the uh, Jews and pagans in the city. Are you, are you familiar with the Medina constitution, the term? Uh, I think it's a good point to mention because it just, you know, outlines some of the, underlines some of the ideas which we can, you know, learn from. 
uh, when Prophet Muhammad migrated from Mecca to Medina in the year 622, uh, he went there as the head of the community of believers, community of Muslims. And many people think that he founded an Islamic state, which is half truth. He actually did not form an Islamic state, which imposed Islam to everybody. What he did was, he made a, he made a treaty, he, which was called the Medina Constitution later, by the people who were in Medina at the time. And there were two main groups in Medina. There were Jews, and there were pagans, idolaters, called the mushrik, you know, the, the polytheists. And in the constitution that Prophet Muhammad signed with them, each group was accepted, and their way of life and their worship was accepted and given a space and legitimacy. And uh, the constitution actually said Muslims have their own religion and Jews have their own religion, so they will live according to that. So I think today some of the Islamic states, uh, like Saudi Arabia, to be frank, I mean, when they don't allow any religion except Islam to, to take place, especially Jewish and Christian religions, I think they are deviating from the traditional Islamic norm, which is allowing different faiths to live under Islam. I mean, you have to have, have that you know, option. I mean, they, they should be there. So uh, anyway, so that tradition of Prophet Muhammad to respect other religions, uh, Judaism, like Judaism and Christianity, continued actually when Muslims went into India. Uh, the, I mean, you know, Muslims had this idea of Ahl Kitab, the people of the book, the Jews and Christians. Well, they are following a somewhat, you know, older and corrupted, basically, message of the same monotheism that we believe in, according to Islamic faith. Uh, but, I mean, they are recognized, as so they have a right, and they are recognized as people with, who have some gift from God, the, the basic idea. Uh, when, they, when Muslims, for example, uh, conquered India, they face people called Hindus. I mean, so what are we going to do with them? I mean, yes, we have this, you know, we know that Jews and Christians have a place in the uh, Quran, Ehd al-Kitab, but what about these Hindus? We haven't seen them before. And after some discussion, the ulema decided to define them as Ehd al-Kitab too, because they have a religion, they have a tradition, they have some moral principles, and ultimately they believe in, in a god. Uh, so other religions were also allowed to flourish under Islam, like Indian religion. And that's why, you know, under the Mughal Empire and other Islamic states in the subcontinent, you know, Hindus were able to practice their faith. Now, when we come to some modern Islamist examples, like the Taliban, for example, we see that they are less tolerant to other faiths than the Islamic tradition used to be. Uh, for example, the Taliban destroyed the mosque, you know, the statues of Buddha, as you well know. Well, and people, the world was surprised by that, but uh, nobody noticed that th those statues were standing there for a thousand years under Islamic rules. I mean, they were there for a thousand years and no Muslim had the idea of destroying them. And one day Taliban came, hey, hey, for, according to Islam, we have to destroy that. Uh, which means, I think, uh, point, which points to the interesting fact that some of the modern Islamist states are much less tolerant than the traditional Islamic uh, you know, states, traditional Islamic uh, polities were. And why is that? I think that's because they, they have created a, a, a bad blend of Islam and some modern ideas, the modern idea of an all-encompassing state. That is actually a modern idea. Because when, you know, before, you know, I said modern world has different varieties. I mean, you have liberal democracy, you have socialism, you have authoritarianism, which is also a very modern idea. You know, dictatorship is a modern idea. So I think some Muslims, uh, t they take from mo modernity authoritarianism, not the idea of liberalism, but authoritarianism. And they make Islam the rule of the land and they don't recognize people in their you know, society who don't follow Islam to you know, live according to their life, to live according to their beliefs. So they want to impose Islam to everybody, make everybody compulsory to go to prayer, make everybody compulsory to do that, make everybody compulsory to accept the Islamic Sharia, and, and also <coughs> neglect the, the 